I realize there's a set of steps that I do for any new project with a back end and a front end that I want to deploy on a publicly facing website. And it's always difficult, even for me, um, it's difficult to find, you know, modern steps to do it. Sometimes you can copy a boilerplate and it's set up in a very specific way. Um, I made my own boilerplate, it's at this repo, and it's based off this gist, which is a set of steps to do it from scratch versus cloning somebody else's repo, and I feel like that's the best way to really understand how to do something like this. And given that I think this is the most common thing that I do uh, as a developer, I thought I'd record the process of doing it from scratch. So. Uh, this is going to presume that you have a few basics, but not, not a ton. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do is uh, you, you'll have to have NPM installed in Node. Um, but if you have that installed on your machine, um, we're going to run this NPM command in a directory for our project. So I've got a folder on my Mac called Podcast. That's going to be my project. Now... I'll probably put some other files that don't need to go into the actual code repo inside this folder. So I always create another folder um, inside of that. And I'm just going to call it PodQuest because even though it's duplicative of the folder that preceded it, it will allow me to search for it. Um, so if I were to just call it, uh, I don't know, code or something like that, I might have a million of those if I develop more than one website on my hard drive. So uh, calling it PodQuest, and then I use Visual Studio Code, so I'm just gonna drag that folder into my Visual Studio Code uh, thing in the app bar. So here we are inside that folder. There's nothing here. Um, VS Code has a terminal, so I'm gonna open that terminal, but you could also use you know, your Mac terminal or uh, what is it? for Windows, pow power, <laughs> I don't know, power whatever, um, or iTerm, you can use whatever you want. I've got VS Code, I recommend v VS Code, I recommend just setting it up so that you can use the terminal inside of VS Code to run your terminal commands. Very first thing here is this terminal command, npm init y, so that just creates a package JSON file um, that allows us to install node packages um, and it sort of bootstraps it with the defaults. So then I'm just going to keep moving through these steps here. So we're going to create a folder called server and we're going to subsequently have a folder called client. Um, so we're going to have the, the server is the back end, the client is the front end. But inside the server folder this is going to be a Node.js app, so we're going to create this index.js, and Node just knows to look for index.js, just the same way that your browser knows to look for index.html as the default file. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this code, and we can run through it really quick. Uh, express, require express, um, and express is a framework for the back end, so it's, it's a way to run your server with some added sort of functionality. Um, you could do this without Express, but um, this, this is gonna make it easier. And um, so we're gonna establish a port, and the port is like where you would access this on your local host or where your server would serve up your backend. Um, so it's gonna look for your process.env.port specification or it's just going to launch it on port 3001 so we probably won't, won't bother with this so it when we run our server it's going to launch it at port 3001 if you wanted to specify something different than this you would create an environment variables file so that's that process.env.port so you would have to create a file called .env and then you would say in that file port equals 999 or whatever. Uh, save it as .env. 
but we're not going to do that for this. Um, okay, so then in my particular boilerplate, we just set up a route, which is the slash dot API. And if someone were to type into the browser localhost colon 3001 slash API, you would send back a response to the front end of our website and it would say you're connected to the server. So that's this message here. Um, so it'd send that as JSON. And then the last piece is it's just going to listen for the port and say, okay, now we're listening on port 3001. So when the server is up and running, it's going to log this one time. So that's that first step. Um, okay, so you notice it's requiring Express, so we need to install Express. So I'm going to run that npm command. Okay. So what did that do? It installed Express, and how do I know? I've got this dependency now, which is called Express. So the other thing we want to do is our package JSON has these scripts and it comes with this test script. So if you ran npm run test, it gives us this output, no test specified, which is exactly what we see here. Now what we want is a start script. Um, NPM always looks for the start script to be able to just like kick off your whole application. So I've got that start script here in the instructions. I'm just going to add that. So what that's going to do is when we say NPM run start or NPM start, you don't have to say run, um, there's a shorthand. It's going to run this terminal command, node server slash index.js, which is that file that we created here. So when we say npm run start, we can now run this. And so now, if I were to go to localhost 3001, that's our server. Uh, we can't get it because it's not a public route, so I'll, I'll clarify that later. But um, if we were to run localhost three, oh, whoops, uh, sorry, three thousand one slash API, I have set up that route, and so it sent us this message back as JSON, and it says connected to server. So you'll notice that was our route that we set up here sent the message, connected to server, as JSON. Great, so that's, uh, that's how we use Node and Express uh, and create a custom route. But that doesn't do much for us. So we need to create a front end that it will actually like give us a little more of a custom, you know, typical website experience. So, and we're going to do that. Uh, this is going to be a React app, which is kind of the most common front end stack for uh, creating reactive websites. So I'm going to run, I'm going to stop that server. I'm going to run that command create React app client. So it's going to install all the dependencies of React in our client folder. So create React app is the npm package, and client is the folder we want that installed to. And you'll notice when we run this, it's going to create its own package JSON file in client for the front end dependencies. So we already have one here in the root of our repo. 
but the client has its own dependencies, so it's going to have its own package JSON. Okay, it finished in the terminal. Uh, create React app, created all kinds of dependencies and scripts and things like that to be able to run React. And we're not going to worry about um, explaining that right now, but um, we have a front end, essentially. Um, but we need to be able to allow the front end to talk to the back end. So that's where this comes in. In that client package JSON, we're going to add this line. So maybe just down here at the bottom. Proxy localhost 3001. Now, if you remember what 3001 was, that is the port in which our server is running. So we're in the root of our repo. I'm say npm run start. That starts our server. Now if I run another terminal window and I change to the client, our front end, and I also say npm run start, that's going to start our React app. It's going to open up a window by default. That's something that uh, this create React app gives us. And we see a front end of a website uh, with some boilerplate. UI, something to see on screen. Uh, obviously, we don't want that. We're going to get rid of it. Um, but now we've got a front end and a back end running. OK, so I mentioned we were going to get rid of all that code on our front end. I'm going to go into source, app.js. This is React code here. Um, and you know, if we want to verify that what we just saw is, is what is being served on the front end of our app, you can see it here. Uh, we've got this paragraph tag, edit app.js to save and reload. That's this. Now I've got this spinning React app logo, that's that, learn React, etc. Okay, so we don't want that. I'm copying and pasting from this just the front end that we want to see right now. So I save that. Now, this automatically refreshes the page. That's something Create React App does. It watches for changes and it refreshes the front end. And so, uh, you know, what we see on screen now is connected to server. Why do we see that? Because of this right here. Uh, if you know React, and you should um, learn it, uh, but there are these things called hooks, and the most basic hook, I would say, is called use effect. And that is designed to listen to whatever you specify in, these, in this array here. Um, so it's going to listen for changes to certain things, and then it's going to do whatever you tell it to do. So this is a function call. It's just an anonymous function in this case. It's going to say, OK, whenever there's a change to anything, because this array is blank, it's going to, like, if there's any change that happens in the React app, um, it's going to go fetch our API right, route from the back end. And then it's going to take a JSON response. It's expecting JSON. And it's going to surface that as a variable called data. And then it's going to run this state action called set data. So it's going to save the data.message to state. 
And then, so, okay, it's in state, but how do we see it? Well, if you know React, you know whatever it puts inside this return statement is what you see on screen. So what you're going to see on screen, in this case, is just a div called app with a header called app header and a paragraph tag that says, if we have data in state, show this status message, loading data. Uh, sorry, loading. Or if we have data, show the data. So in this case, we do have the data from our back end, so it says connected to server. So how do we know the data from the back end? Well, we called that fetch route, fetch API. API said, OK. I heard somebody call in my name. I'm going to respond with the fact that you are indeed connected to the server. The simplest way we can wire the front end to the back end. So there you go. We got a front end and back end of a React app, React Node Express app talking to each other. What's next? OK, we don't need two Git files on top of each other. Um, we just need the one in our root. Um, so we want to make sure that any changes we make to either the front or the back end of the app are saved in Git. But you know, having a Git repo inside a Git repo is not something we want. So. I'm going to have to show the invisible files you know, here in Mac. Uh, it doesn't show those by default. Um, so I just entered a shortcut to show invisible files. But you could do um, view, I don't remember what it is, uh, show view options maybe. No. Um, I don't know. <laughs> You're going to have to look at what the. The shortcut is shift command period, but uh, there's some other menu option that will allow you to show the invisible files if you're not big on shortcuts. But anyway, because um, it's a folder that starts with dot, Mac hides these by default. I'm not sure what PC does, um, but it's got a, a its own Git repo in here, and we're just going to delete that. You could also type in these terminal commands here. But no, I'm, I'm just going to do it through a graphical user interface because I'm a visual person. All right, and then um, now I'm providing some modified code to put on the back end. We're just going to paste that in there. So this is existing code, this stuff up here. Um, but I'm going to paste in these changes. Sorry, that, that could be a lot clearer, I think. Um, I will change that documentation. But really, what you should be doing is pasting Right here. So what we're doing is we're saying serve the files for our React app out of this client build folder.
And you'll notice we have client, we don't have a build folder yet. Uh, and I will uh, cover that in a minute. We wanna, we wanna actually build our app at some point so it will serve up sort of like a bundled up version of our front end. Um, right now, what we have is source folder. We don't have a, a build folder. Uh, so the source contains all of our source code, but we don't want, you know, the average person to be able to see all that stuff. They, we want to deliver them a, an optimized and secure and private version of the website that doesn't compromise any secrets or anything we, d we don't want them to see, um, that will load faster, etc. So that's going to be in that build folder. That's why this says um, serve up client.build. So why is it dot, dot, dot? Because... Our back end is where? Within server, but our um, if we're operating within server, we wanna go back a directory, the dot dot slash, which puts us in our root, and then into the client folder, and then into a build folder, which we will create shortly. Okay, so that's how we wire up our front end. We still have this thing where if we fetch the API route, it'll respond with connected to server. And then what Express does is it says for anything else that doesn't match anything above it, in this case only API, we're just going to say serve up the index.html file out of the build folder. So. When you don't know what to do, just serve up the root file out of the front end. So I'm gonna save this. And now we need that build step. So we're gonna add to our, sorry, I can't type, package JSON in the root. We have that start step. Let's add the build step. And what is that step? It says change to the client directory and install any dependencies that we need for React and then run the build step. So I'm going to save that. And then the other thing that we want to do, and, and this is going to be for... Um, servers or uh, like Heroku. Uh, in this case, we're going to use Heroku. Um, we want to add this engines declaration. And the reason we want that is it's just going to tell us what version of node to run. Well, how do we know what version of node we have? Uh, you say node v. We could put whatever we want here. Um, in fact, we may want to do something that's backwards compatible. We don't necessarily need node version 18, but I, since I'm going to be doing some um, kind of cutting edge uh, code in this app, I'm going to just use um, node version 18. So where it says your node version, we'll just say greater than or equal to 18.0.0. Hopefully that should get us there. I think that should be fine. I don't know. All right. Now we need a git ignore file that's just going to ignore all the stuff that we don't want to commit to our repo, just in case we want to do this as open source or whatever. Uh, whoever has access to this repo, we, we don't need them to install all this unnecessary stuff that may accumulate on our computer as we build this app. So these are some common things that uh, are encompassed in that, and they go into a git ignore file. So I'm just going to say in the root of our repo, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to save it as .git ignore. Ignore that warning. Uh, it's just telling me that dot files are, are often hidden. That's what we want. 
Um, so it's going to say, okay, ignore anything in node modules. Why that? That's where anything we install with npm install goes. So you can see for this app, we've got all kinds of folders here with files inside of them. And that's the stuff that uh, Node and Express need to run. Um, so it's got a lot of dependencies, but we don't want to commit those because that just takes up space in our GitHub repo. And it doesn't really relate to the code we're writing. It's just part of that NPM package. And uh, whoever you distribute this code to, they can get all that stuff when they run NPM install. So you don't need to host it up on your GitHub repo because that would be excessive. Um, so we're going to ignore node modules. We're going to ignore that .env file, which if you remember, um, that's where we're going to put all our like secrets. And then this DS store is a Mac thing, but PC has, I think, something similar, maybe the same thing, um, which just like is a way to index what's on your computer file system. Um, and so anyway, it creates these .ds store files that uh, I think serve some metadata about uh, your file system that makes it easy for Finder, in this case, to, to find your files and know when they changed or whatever. Uh, so anyway, those are just common things to put in your git ignore. All right, so we've got that. Now we're ready to put this thing somewhere where people can see it. Um, so I've already done this step, uh, so it wouldn't do anything if I do it. Um, but what we want is the, if we're going to put it on Heroku, we want the Heroku command line interface. Uh, you might see the acronym CLI. That's what that stands for. It's just a way for services to be able to give you a set of commands that you can run on your terminal on your computer um, that allow you to interface with their service. So um, I could say um, oops, what was my password? There we go. Um, I could run this command. doesn't hurt. Uh, it will update anything that uh, is changed, um, but it's just installing all of these dependencies and this slash g means we're installing them globally for anybody anywhere uh, who wants to run these heroku commands it's going to take some time and you know we're getting these errors because it already exists so no problem you you probably won't see those uh, I've got the command line interface, hopefully you do too. Because now you can run this next command, which is Heroku login. It says hit any key. I'm gonna do that. It's gonna open a web browser. You're gonna have to create an account. I've already created an account, and since I brought logged in recently, I was able to just hit that button and said, okay, you're logged in. So when we go back here, you see these messages, logging in, done, you're logged in as your username. Awesome. Now, what Heroku needs is a publicly, well, it needs a GitHub repo. Um, so let's create one. repositories, new, if you have multiple GitHub accounts, you'll need to specify which one you're adding it to. So this is mine, PodQuest, ask questions about podcast episodes and receive answers from an AI. That bot. That's what my app is going to do. Eh, make it public. You don't need a README file yet. Uh, we already created a gitignore file, so uh, keep that. 
and uh, I'm not going to specify a license right now. Okay, so that repo is created. This is the URL. And we can refer back to later. Um, but now we can run this set of commands to add to that repo. So git init just says, okay, create a git repo at the root of our folder here. And you want to make sure that you're actually in the root of the folder when you run this terminal command. Um, how would you know? You can type pwd, which is present working directory. And it's going to say, okay, I'm in this directory on my hard drive. If I wanted to click on that, uh, let's see. That's a command. Open, that opens my finder. Um, and we can see, okay, yep, I've got my client, my server, my package JSON, so I know I'm in the root when I run this command. Okay. All right, so now if we want to see what we're about to commit to the repo, say get status. And it's telling us all the stuff that um, is in here, but it's saying nothing's been, been added. Um, but this is what it wants to add. Um, and I'm actually seeing this node modules folder, which we put in our git ignore. So there's a problem there. Uh, we don't want that. And I, I can see what it is. Um, we've got this comma in there. Um, so it's, it's not going to match that pattern because it's, it's not finding it. Um, so let me make that change. And I need to uh, change that in my instructions too. But anyway, now the node modules are gone. So that's good. We want that. Um, we actually, uh, yep, no, that, everything's good now. So now we can um, proceed with these instructions. Git add all of this stuff. And if we type git status now, it's going to say, OK, this is all the stuff that is ready to go into git. And there's no node modules, but there is all this client code, our package.json, our server index file, et cetera, uh, as well as a git ignore file itself. OK. So now, how do we push it up to our GitHub repo? Or how do we commit it to Git? We say git commit. And we just give it a message. And that message is, this is our first commit. Now, the other thing that we do here is um, we just want a remote server to have a branch called main. And we're going to tie. that repo that we created to our local repo. So it's going to say, OK, when we push the code from our local repo up to GitHub, this is where it's going to go. So I'll paste this code. Oops. Sorry. Paste that code. And then rather than all this stuff here, it's just git remote add origin and then whatever the URL of your GitHub repo is. There we go. So now it's got a place to go online. And now how do we push it up to that repo? You say git push. We want to make sure we're authenticated. And then our origin. is the nickname for like the the main place where we're putting it, which is, is GitHub. We could put this on Bitbucket or some other place. Um, and then what branch are we pushing? We're pushing the main branch. Um, so that's kind of the default place. We do that. It writes it. And now if we go here, 
and refresh the page, we see that all of our code is up on GitHub. Okay. So we want it to get onto Heroku, onto a server that can actually like run this app. So we can run it locally, but we can't, no one else can see it, right? Like nobody's gonna see local hosts, that's for us. So we're gonna use that Heroku command line interface to add a remote for Heroku, the same way we added one for GitHub. So we're gonna say Heroku git remote add, and then we just give it a name called PodQuest. So now if I were to say git push Heroku PodQuest, it would um, know where to push this code. And then I'm just gonna add a commit message there. Okay. So now if we wanna put it up on Heroku, here we do, git push Heroku main. So instead of origin, we now have Heroku. So instead of going to GitHub, it's going to Heroku. And what branch? The main branch. So it's gonna take some time. And if we want, we can check to make sure it's working. Um, I'm logged in. Um, I use Mozilla as my default browser, so I'm logged in there. And um, our app was called PodQuest. If we look at the activity, it's building. And we can actually see all the things that it's doing. And that's the same stuff it would do on our local computer, uh, but it's doing it on the Heroku servers. So it's saying, installing the binaries from package.json, so all of our NPM dependencies, running the build, NPM run build, doing all this stuff. And so we should, oh, but we're not up and running. Um, we have an error. This is good. This will help you understand how to troubleshoot an error. So it gives us the command to run to figure out what happened uh, on Heroku. So. Heroku logs, so we're looking at the server logs, and if we scroll to the top of the server log, it says, okay, we created a release, the build succeeded, so it actually built the app, and then we tried to start it, and that's where the error happened. And if you look at these closely, this will take some work to figure out where your error happened, but um, it's saying reference error, path is not defined. And where did that error occur? It occurred in our index.js file, in our app server folder, at line eight, column 24. So that tells us exactly where to look for the error. And if I look in index.js, this is line eight, and column 24 just means like how far over in the text. Um, this is column 24, we see this referenced path. Um, so it's saying it, it doesn't know what path is. It's, there's no variable here called path. Um, we required express, but we didn't require path. Um, I'm using GitHub Copilot and it's saying, yo, uh, put that in there. Um, so I'm just gonna accept that, but that is how you require the path. Um, so I missed that, um, my bad. I'm gonna also have to change the instructions to specify that. Um, so now we need to we need to we made that change. Sorry. Um, so we need to add it. Specify path dependency. I can commit it to GitHub. 
and I can commit it to Heroku. And again, it's going to go through this process. You can watch it as it happens. It's running the build step. Okay, it says build succeeded. Which happened last time, we've still got an error, so uh, we need to wait and make sure this actually worked. And this is where it's telling us it's going to find our app. Got it open. We still have an error. So let's look. See what it says. App crashed. So it didn't find our root path here. So something must be missing. Let's go back to our tutorial here and see what it asks us to put in. Got that stuff. Did I delete something that? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I did. When I pasted in this updated code on the server, I deleted something I shouldn't have, which is the thing that tells Node to listen to the port in the first place. So I'm going to add that in. I'm going to commit it to Git. message, add the port listen, git push, Heroku, push our main branch, going to kick that off, while it's doing that, I will push it also to GitHub, which we called origin, that's done. All right, let's hope this works. You can see the build is in progress. Check our status. We did it. Open our app. And hopefully, yay, we got it. OK, so now whatever we ran on our local host, we can also now see on Heroku. So that's it. Uh, 40 minutes in, we have a full stack node express react app doing absolutely nothing uh, but that is modern web dev uh, that's what it takes to uh, deploy a full stack app to a hosted uh, cloud service and uh, you know in future tutorials we can talk about how to make it actually do something uh, more interesting than say connected to server <laughs>